Good morning. Thanks, George. Glad the quality looks good. Good morning, all. Get, we'll get going in a minute or two. I'm going to try to monitor the Facebook chat while I go. We'll see how that works. <laughs> block to cut off this stupid advertisement on the Justin TV page. We can actually do this. I guess we're at 12, so I'm I'm ready to go if everyone else is. Well, what I'm what I'd like to do this morning, uh, well, I guess this afternoon now it's 12 of one here, is to talk about how we might best engage uh, critics of markets. And for the most part, what I'm going to do is talk about folks on the political left, since they are generally the ones we think of as being the critics of markets. So there's certainly issues on which uh, folks. Uh, how, how's that? Is that is that better? How uh, folks? There are issues on which folks on the right, of course, are critics of markets too. But I'm I'm, I'm less interested in those than I am. Uh, the folks, folks on the left. Okay, so that's going to be the focus of my talk. Uh, focus of my talk this morning. And again, let me know if there's problems with the audio or video. I am trying to, as I said, monitor the the, uh, the Facebook chat. Okay. So I think what I, what I want to do is first talk about who are we talking about here. Who are we? Uh, who are we trying to communicate with? And generally, I guess you know. Uh, for me as an academic, it falls into three kinds of categories. Uh, one, uh, other academics, since I spend most of my life around them, that's, uh, that's a major concern for me. Uh, the media is another, right? We have uh, certainly plenty of folks in the media who are critics of markets, and, and I've been doing more media work recently and sort of thinking about how we engage them uh, is, another, is another issue. And then third, and perhaps the most difficult ones, are sort of friends and family types, and, and how, if we're serious about sort of bringing our message to other people, how do we engage them uh, in, in these kinds of conversations? So those are the three groups I'm thinking of. And, and for me, the question is, how do we engage these critics most effectively? That is, how in, uh, in ways they haven't before. Uh-oh. I, have I lost my video there? No, oh, there we go. It's back. Okay, so that that's the idea, which is how do we how do we engage those folks? How do we move the conversation forward? And so what I'm hoping to do is uh, I have about seven guidelines that I want to talk about. I'm going to put those out on the table. Uh, let's see if that helps. Uh, I'm going to put those guidelines out on the table and and uh, and let you think about those, and I'll keep an eye on the chat at the same time and and see if I can answer questions as we go or. I'll certainly leave some time at the end for folks to take to take questions. OK. 
Okay. All right. So with that in mind, here we go. Um, here's again seven, I think, different guidelines we might use when we're talking to the critics critics of markets. Okay. First, uh, make it about means, not about ends. And, and what I mean by that is we want to engage this conversation with folks by not questioning their goals or what they're after, but in fact saying, yeah, we, like you, particularly folks on the left, for me, uh, share many of the same goals, many of the same ends, many of the same things we want to accomplish. We care about making the world a better place in similar kinds of ways. The differences between us are frequently about how best to do that, what are the best means of accomplishing those, those ends. And so I think when we engage those kind of critics of markets, what we need to be thinking about is structuring the conversation that way. Uh, and I think there's two pieces of that that I would mention. One is from our end, okay, we need to not uh, be critical of their ends. We need to not sort of say, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a bad person or you want to restrict everybody's freedom or these sorts of things. And simply instead talk about, look, you want to improve, say, the, the, the condition of poor people in the United States. So do we. Okay, how best do we do that? Your means to that end may not work as effectively as you think. Our, our means might be better. So rather than questioning the goal, the idea is how do we convince them that our means to that end uh, are, 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 more, are more important, are more, are more effective in, in, in achieving those ends. And I think on the other hand, there's an obligation on us with respect to how, how we argue with other people, which is we cannot cede the moral high ground to them. We can't let them uh, take that position where their view of the world is somehow morally superior to ours. And I'm sure you've been in conversations with people where you have that happen, right, where they either name call or somehow interpret your defense of liberty as being, uh, being somehow a, a morally suspect thing. And I think you can't let that happen. You have to challenge that right away and say, no, I'm after the same desirable goals that you are but we're, we simply differ on how best to achieve them. The moment we give up that moral high ground, I think, and, and let critics of markets keep it, uh, we're in trouble. We're, our, our argumentatively, sort of rhetorically, we're not going to succeed in, in moving them anywhere. So for me, that's a really important. For me, that's one of the most fundamental things I try to do when I'm talking with critics of markets. That is, focus on the means, not on the ends. So that's one guideline to think about. Um, Second guideline to think about, use the best available theory and history that you can. I think when we talk with critics of markets, uh, we need to know our stuff really, really well. And I would add to that, in some ways, we need to know their arguments as well or better than they do. One of the things I find when I uh, often engage, even with my sort of fellow academics, is that, that they don't understand their own arguments as well as I do. <laughs> and I think that's really important. We need to be aware of what critics of markets are saying and what the good arguments are on the other side, but particularly we need to be what uh, we need to know what the best arguments are on our side. That is trying to stay up with, w with what the best evidence is for certain kinds of uh, policies or certain you know or, or for markets in general, uh, what what economists and others are saying. Uh, uh, about those things, all of those are really, really important. Uh, and again, it's hard, I mean, it's, e it's easier for me as a sort of professional economist to stay up with these things, that's what I do. But I think there's lots of ways for uh, people within the libertarian movement, within the freedom movement, to do this without having to be an expert. Uh, Facebook is the is the greatest uh, invention for this, I think, ever. If you follow, uh, there's plenty of academics and policy people who are on Facebook, uh, like myself, um, and we use it a lot to sort of link to ideas, to spread ideas, to to give to give uh, new sources of information. So you don't have to know everything yourself. You just got to know the people who do, and that's the magic of social networking and of, uh, of, of of the internet. So one of my recommendations here, if you're someone who's engaging these conversations a lot and you want to stay posted on sort of what's new and what the best arguments are, find good people to follow on Facebook. Find good blogs to follow. Um, uh, keep up with where where the action is on on the on the internet. And so I think that that's uh, that's a really a really good thing to do. So that's a second, uh, a second kind of consideration to think about. My third one is uh, a, a strategy that I think is, you know, always good for whenever you're engaged in these kind of conversations. Don't be suckered in to, to arguments where they are comparing their perfect world to your imperfect world. Okay. 
And I think that's, we get trapped in this sometimes, where we know that, uh, and I'm going to come back to this point in, in a little bit, we know that a, a free world is not a utopia. Human beings are flawed, bad stuff's still going to happen. We just think it's the best world that we can we can live in. Um, but oftentimes what happens is critics want to say, well, you know, if, if we would regulate this particular thing, here's how it would work, and we would stop and think about, for example, the banking system and the recession and all this, and people say, well, look, if we just had the right people and the right regulations in place, right, we'd solve all of these problems. Um, and they turn to us and say, and of course, in your world, right, we have all these messy, messy things happen all the time. And I think Responding to that is really important by saying, well, wait a second, you're imagining this ideal perfect way in which regulation would work, but we know that, reg that the state is not perfect. We know that politicians are self-interested. We know that, that regulation doesn't work. In fact, that's why we had the crisis we're in. Um, so you always want to try to make the comparison, not their perfect world against our imperfect world. And, and it's wrong to do the reverse, by the way, right, to argue our perfect world versus their imperfect one. Get it on the level of imperfection, right, where we're talking about what, how liberty really works and how the state really works. And if we get it there, right, that's, you know, th I think those kind of arguments are most effective, uh, are, are particularly, again, with, with critics of markets who want to argue that if we intervene in these sorts of ways, we'll solve all of these problems. And, and oftentimes they're making those arguments on a rather naive view of the, of the state and of, of politics. So I think it's really important to keep the playing field level. And that does lead me into my fourth point, which I think is uh, a tricky one sometimes for, for libertarians, and that is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the better. And what I mean by that is we want to have, we have this sort of tendency to argue that uh, a free society will sort of solve all these problems. We get into these debates with people and we're, we have all these good arguments. And it often sounds like we're painting this sort of utopian picture of, of what freedom will bring. And again, I think we have to avoid that. Liberty's not utopia. Uh, no system is utopia, right? Um, there's a great quote that Hayek used in The Road to Serfdom from a German thinker. It says something like, um, the reason that the state has, ha, has created hell on earth is that people have always thought it would bring heaven. Right, and so that, that that idea, right, that no system's perfect, and that we have to um, engage in the comparative analysis of imperfect systems is really important. If we start making it seem like liberty will, you know, make the seas run with lemonade and chickens fly into our mouth and get rid of bad breath and everything else, um, I don't think we're going to be very effective because no earthly world, <laughs> you know, can 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 do that. And I think related to that is we have to be careful. To, to talk about how a free society doesn't just produce better outcomes, which it does, but it also enables human beings to learn from their mistakes and learn more effectively from their mistakes. That's, that's a problem that the state has, right? That, that political systems are very bad at learning from their mistakes. Um, if they had learned from their mistakes, we wouldn't, again, be in the recession and crisis we've seen over the last few years, not to mention a whole bunch of other kinds of examples that we can, we can bring up. But particularly for me, when I think about economic regulation, that's a key issue, which is uh, regulators and the state in general can't learn when, when they screw up, right? Often because they're screwing up, gets them votes, it pays off politically. Again, think about what, what we're doing, you know, what we've done overseas over the last 10, 15 years in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and everywhere else. Um, so I think one challenge we can throw at people sometimes is, in your world, right, how are people going to learn from their mistakes? At least we have a mechanism with the market uh, and with other institutions of civil society how we, might, how we might learn from our mistakes. So that's the fourth point. Again, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the better. All we need to do is to argue liberty is better. It's for the best, right? We don't need to argue it's perfect. And if we try to argue it's perfect, we're going to end up falling short of that inevitably. And I think that's going to harm, harm, harm our argument. Um, I think another thing we have to think about when we engage critics of markets and, and, and critics of liberty in general is uh, the goal isn't, turn, isn't to turn them into anarcho-capitalists in one conversation. You know, too often you get into these debates, or I see debates other people have, other libertarians have, where it's like 
no no sort of consideration of where their audience is and it's as if their goal in every single conversation is to convert that person into an anarcho capitalist in a, in a ten minute conversation if you enter the conversation that way you're almost doomed to fail I think okay again you could there I think libertarians sometimes fear that if we if we don't do that we're somehow sacrificing our principles but I think there's all kinds of ways that you can stay true to your principles but realize that what your goal in conversations with critics is, is to move them one step closer to liberty. That's all you can do in 10 minutes or 30 minutes. That's all you can do in a thread on Facebook, right, is, is move people one or two steps closer. And one problem here, of course, is if, if you could change someone's worldview in one conversation, the next person they talk to could change it right back, and and that's a way. Now you've wasted your time, and you haven't got anywhere with with the people in question. So for me, I think uh, I always think in terms of where is this person coming from? What are they? You know, what are their views? How do I move them forward? How do I get them to see something? One point, two points that they haven't that they haven't seen before. Um, I have a colleague here at my university who I've known for you know he's been here I want to say seven eight years now. And we chat from time to time. He's definitely a, a, a lefty, but a, I think a principled lefty. And over the years, you know, I think I've got him more sympathetic to libertarian ideas, not by trying to completely change his mind in every conversation, but to find specific issues to, to work on where I can push him a little bit to see how libertarians might, might see that, that issue. So part of this, too, I think, is picking your battles, okay? When you're in a conversation with someone about topic X, you don't have to convince them about A, B, C, D, and E. Just work on X, okay? Move them on X. If they move on X, then you can next time you engage them, you can work on eight, you know, all these other topics by engaging them in the same sort of things you did when you were talking about 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 the other topics. So again, I don't think uh, I don't think that we have to think in terms of changing people completely in every conversation that we have. So that's five. Uh, again, don't have to turn people into anarcho capitalists in in, in one conversation. Uh, my sixth point I would raise is we, it's really important for us to avoid demonizing both the left and the right uh, when we when we engage them in conversation. Too often, again, I think we see uh, you know libertarians engage these conversations by starting off by saying, "Oh, well, you're you're a you know you're a lefty, you must hate freedom." Okay, or you're a lefty, you're out to uh, you know control everyone's uh, everyone's activity in the market. You don't you don't care about freedom, whatever whatever it might be. Uh, on the right, right, you know, we tend to say, oh, you know, you want to because they want to restrict sort of uh, civil liberties and social freedoms. Oh, you're a fascist. Okay, I mean, we sort of see this kind of language, and again, I think that's really really important to avoid. Um, we need to again, take people as arguing with us in good faith until we have substantial evidence to the contrary, right? So assume that this person, you know, really does want to make the world a better place until there's some clear uh, evidence that they don't. And if we start the conversation by demonizing them, by saying, okay, you're this or you're that, it, it doesn't work. And I, I get this all the time, or see this all the time, when, when people whose politics and whose view of the world I generally agree with start demonizing uh, academics, though they're all a bunch of, particularly lefty academics, all a bunch of sort of politically correct, this and that, and once you do that, they're not going to listen to you, or me, frankly. Um, so I think uh, it's really important not to demonize people and not to, to treat them uh, as, 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 uh, as having bad faith, as, as being engaged in this conversation for reasons other than really wanting to make the world a, a better place. Now, again, I'm not denying that there are plenty of people, both left and right, who really aren't arguing in good faith. But you've got to start with that. You've got to assume that they're there for the right kinds of reasons uh, and that they, want to, uh, that they want to hear what you have to say um, until they give you a reason otherwise. Then it's okay to say, okay, no, you're not, you know, you're not engaging me in a, in a productive way. Uh, I think related to this is, a, is a, one issue that I've been harping about a lot recently that I'll raise here too. And I think it's really important for us to avoid uh, conspiracy, theory tile, conspiracy theory style thinking. Uh, too often, uh, libertarians, some libertarians come off this way, and I think it really, really shuts down conversations with, with our critics. Right away, then they, it gives them ammunition to say, oh, well, you just think there's a bunch of people secretly manipulating this, that, or the other, uh, and they're simply not going to uh, uh, hear what we, what we have to say. 
Uh, I think, you know, the area that I know a lot about where I see this happen all the time, of course, is on monetary policy issues in the Fed and libertarians sort of skating this line about the Fed uh, being this sort of 100-year-old grand conspiracy to, to, you know, do everything from, from to monetary policy through, you know, uh, funding governments overseas and, all, you know, the whole story. And, and, of course, the danger with that particular one is there's a long history of anti-Fed conspiracy theorizing that's uh, really uh, anti-Semitic and otherwise problematic. Don't get me wrong. It's not to say that we can't and shouldn't and uh, be critical of the Fed. I've been, uh, you know, I've been arguing to get rid of the Fed for 25 years. But we have to do it in ways that really address the substantive arguments about theory and history and not uh, engage in this kind of, con uh, of, of, of conspiracy theory uh, type argument. Does it mean that there aren't people out there trying to use the state to benefit themselves and, and gain power? Absolutely. All right. But we need to recognize, too, that a lot of the ways in which uh, these government institutions have arisen is because people were just wrong on the facts or wrong on the theory. They thought these institutions would solve problems that, in fact, uh, they, they did not or could not. And if we uh, assume that everything we don't like is the product of some grand conspiracy, and I'm not even mentioning 9-11 here, right, I think we undermi undermine our arguments uh, uh, almost immediately. Uh, another point I think to consider, too, is another strategy for me, and this is particularly with the left. I think if you can find ways to analogize from issues that people on the left do agree with to ones that we agree with, but they don't, that can be, be particularly effective. Um, for example, if you're arguing with someone on the left who is opposed to the war on drugs, there's a lot of ways you can use the same kinds of arguments that uh, libertarians use about why the war on drugs is a bad idea to talk about other kinds of issues. Okay? You can make the point, look, you really believe that uh, governments don't have a right to tell you what you can put into your body, okay? and so that's why people should be allowed to smoke pot or snort, snort coke or whatever it is. Well, then let's talk about all these other kinds of issues and you know, obesity and, and, and uh, the Center for the Study of uh, Public Interest in Science and all these folks who want to restrict salt content and these kinds of things, right? If we really believe, if you don't believe it's a problem for people to smoke pot, then surely you don't believe it's a problem for people to eat too much salt or, or have their daily dose of bacon or whatever it might be. So I think that those kinds of arguments, those analogous kinds of arguments, if you believe this, Okay, then look at this issue over here and see how it's the same uh, and see whether or not you can, you can, uh, you can push them that way. Um, I think a particularly effective set of arguments here has to do, you know, ones that come from evolutionary type theory. There's a lot of ways w that you can defend a free society uh, using evolutionary type arguments, right? That markets in particular are uh, the products of social evolution, that the ways in which markets are self uh, regulating processes and self-organizing processes. This whole idea of spontaneous order that we see uh, in the works of people like Hayek, all of those things have their uh, analogs in the scientific world, particularly in Darwinian evolution. And so, it, you know, if, if you, friends on the left in particular, who are skeptical about things like intelligent design, okay, um, why not take that as a, you know, take that as a launching point to say, if you don't think, uh, someone you know could design the human eye or, or, or that you understand how something as complex as the human eye or human beings or whatever could emerge out of this undesigned process well then wait a second okay this is the argument we're making about markets right that that the order of the marketplace did not come because people constructed consciously intentionally designed market institutions and market outcomes they are produced by these evolutionary processes as well and so arguing in those kind of ways I think can be can be uh, particularly particularly effective. So those are a few thoughts I had. I, I don't see much happening on the Facebook chat. So if there's folks who have specific questions, you know, that's that's the place to shoot them. I'm watching it while I talk. And while I drink some water as well. Uh, and I'm certainly uh, uh, happy to to sort of uh, answer questions on any of these issues. Anything about how we might better engage. Uh, critic, critics of markets. I have a few more things I can say too, but uh, hopefully there's there's folks with questions. So I'll wait for a minute. Well, looking at the chat, um, I'm going to go to James's question there. Um, 
Right. I think I think James's point is exactly right about the Fed, which is there's plenty of evidence for Fed shenanigans. I think that's a great word, right? No need for conspiracies. The Fed the Fed screws up all the time. Okay. Um, <laughs> Other questions I'm looking at uh, here too. What about demonizing true status scum? Uh, you know, again, the question is when do you when do you get to that point, right? When do you get to the point where uh, you can say you're really status scum? And I think when we see, for me, one of the things that I've been following a lot recently is, and I think the TSA just saw that pop up on the chat. That I've written a bunch of stuff on the TSA, and I think that's another good case where where now we've sort of given government sanction to to uh, to to things that if private citizens did would immediately be called sexual assault. So again, there I think you can go after them pretty pretty hard. I'm going to take Antonio's question about the idea that freer markets left kids dying in the streets and water polluted and so on. So I think those those kinds of those are arguments we get all the time, and I think. To think about those, we need to often shift the discussion a little bit to the larger history, okay? There's no doubt, look, the world's not a perfect place, right? I mean, there, there have always been, uh, there's always been polluted water and dying, you know, and kids dying and all these sorts of things. Um, but I think what we have to make, the argument we have to make is that uh, over the longer haul of history, capitalism and markets have reduced all that. For, for example, Infant mortality rates today are a fraction of what they were previously. Why? We're wealthier. That wealth has enabled us to develop technology. Okay. That technology has has enabled us to lower infant mortality rates significantly. The eradication or near eradication of, of, of childhood disease is another one. You think it's markets that left people dying in the street. It's capitalism that came along and gave us the wealth, right, that enabled us to, to, to clean up these kinds of problems in the first place. Um, another related one here is you see people say, oh, well, you know, capitalism gave us child labor and all these sorts of things. Actually, no. Capitalism ended child labor. Kids worked on farms for centuries, for, for millennia, right? And, and it was the advent of industrialization in the factory system that, one, moved kids out of farm work 14 hours a day into the indoors to do that work to the degree kids worked in the factory. But the factory system also created so much wealth that we're, that we're able to, uh, that we're, we're that creating enough wealth that we were able to get kids out of the workplace because the salaries paid to parents were, su were sufficient that children didn't have to work anymore. So again, if you want to, if people are concerned about, about child labor, we need to make the point that capitalism ended child labor. It didn't make it, it didn't, it didn't make it worse. So again, I think knowing these, these longer kinds of history, um, there's a whole interesting history of the, of the role that the private sector played in the water supply in London in the, in the 17th and 18th century. So it wasn't, again, it wasn't that capitalism produced the dirty water. Human beings have had dirty water forever. It was, it was markets and, and capitalism that came along and started to clean all that stuff up. So again, again, there I think that's a that's a you know we, we, we need to know the broader history. Um, there was a question I'm scrolling back um, to an earlier point. Um, this is Eric's point about a combination of public choice, anti-war rhetoric, agreeing with civil liberties works great on the left. Right, I think that's right. Okay, and I, I think the interesting thing about the public choice type things, right, is that um, when we when we talk about the failures of government, oftentimes people on the left will say, well, look. Uh, it, if we had better people in office, right, we would we would solve these problems. And what's funny about that is people on the left criticize capitalism for its structural problems all the time. What they like to say is, well, it's not that capitalists are bad people, it's that the system's all screwed up. But when they turn around to talk about government, they flip it around. They say, oh, no, 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 there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the system. It's just that we don't have the right people in office. And I think that's a point we can go at both right and left and say, especially the left, though, who tends to make these structural arguments about capitalism. And say, if you think markets don't work because there's these ingrained institutional problems, well, why aren't you thinking the same way <coughs> about how government works, right? That it's not it's not because Bush was a bad person that we ended up in all these wars, or Obama's a bad person that we end up. That's what government does. That's what the state does, uh, and that the incentive structure within government is such that that it that it, it pushes people to do these sorts of things. So I think it is, I agree that using public choice type arguments, is, it can be very effective with the left. Um, and, and, uh, but, we, but we need to point out, too, uh, what the implication of those public choice arguments is, is that it's not the wrong people in government, it's a structural problem with government uh, itself. And I want to go to Carol's question, um, the, sort of the idea that, that 
emphasizing community self-determination and the right to have all the socialism they want in their own communities. Uh, to me, that's a, I think that's a great way to go, uh, particularly, particularly with, um, with lefties. And hang on, I just want to write down one question I just saw come up. Uh, and, and, and the idea of community self-determination is really important. I think one of the most fundamental things that uh, libertarians have done wrong historically, and I think there's reasons that we have, but that's been better in the last decade or two, is that we're finally talking about things other than the market or the state, right? We're talking about these institutions of civil society. We're talking about things like how do voluntary communities form? How do they create structures within those communities um, uh, to, that, that enable them to solve problems that aren't sort of for-profit necessarily, but are also uh, uh, not government. And, and I think the Internet's made this possible. It's enabled libertarians to kind of come together and uh, people in the freedom movement to come together and, and, and deal with these sorts of problems. We've I've seen a few examples in, in recent years of, 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 of folks, of activists, say, getting in jail or having other problems where the networks that they were able to tap, tap into uh, you know, uh, were able to help them out. And that's terrific. And that is what freedom does. And I think stressing those kinds of things to the left and, you know, the whole free state project and all that is terrific, too, to say, oh, you know, we want for you the same thing we want for ourselves, which is the right to form these own, our own communities to live by our own rules. And I think here, too, I don't know how many, you know, if you read the literature, this is a, 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 an argument that Robert Nozick made back in his Anarchy, State, and Utopia in the 1970s, saying that, that, the, that utop the way he put it was utopia is a collection of utopias. And again, what he mean by that, what he meant by that, is that the, the sort of the libertarian utopian world was a one where people could form their own kinds of communities and set up whatever rules within those communities they wanted, right, as long as entrance and exit was, was voluntary. And I think that's a really nice vision for us to think about and to say, and as Carol said, in talking with the left, that one way to understand uh, what the freedom movement is about is just that, the right to, to, that children and the problems children raise uh, are, are uh, problems for any political philosophy, not, not just for, for libertarianism. But I think, you know, as we think about, uh, about these questions, too, that's one that we, we have to do. With. There was a question way back about the, the first world and third world that I wanted to make sure I said a few things about. And uh, let me see if I can scroll through and... And, and there it is. It was C. Taylor Harris's question about handling the first world as stealing from the third world argument. Yeah, um, I think there's a couple things that you can say there. First of all, the evidence is pretty clear, uh, and if you look at these sort of indexes of economic freedom, that uh, the places in the third world that have done the best in the last decade, two decades, three decades, are the places that places that have had the strongest market institutions. Um, too often, what these folks are saying is is that the fate of third world economies is totally dependent upon what we do in the first world. That all of their, that what matters most of the third world is what we'll call external policies, that is, how the first world treats them. Um, but the reality is, is that what really damages most third world po uh, uh, economies is their own policies, their internal policies. And y yes, Carol, mine's cut, it's cutting off occasionally on me too, I'm not sure why. Uh, so, so one of the things that we have to we have to uh, be thinking about there is is with the first and third world argument is focusing on the policy that people in the third world have adopted and not just assume that their fortunes are dependent only on what we do here in the in the in the first world. Um, so that's one element of it. I think related to that, one of the arguments we can make is that if if the third world uh, was com if their fortunes were completely dependent upon us that the only way they could get wealthy is by us transferring them, or if they're not wealthy because we're taking from them, then the question is, how did we ever get rich in the first world? There was no you know, other richer society that sort of did it for us. We were able to do it ourselves by, again, adopting the right institutions, by adopting uh, the right kinds of practices. And so if we're really concerned about improving the wealth of the third world, that's what needs to happen. I think a more general point with this whole first third world thing is that and reminding people that trade is mutually beneficial, that even the trade that we make with our local grocery store, we both benefit by it. And so the interactions that we in the first world have with the third world, uh, as long as they're genuinely trade, right, are, are in fact uh, 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 mutually beneficial. Uh, and again, I just saw J James anticipated my, my next comment, which was, and there are, you know, we again, we shouldn't 
paint a perfect picture here. There are plenty of ways in which historically the first world has damaged the third world. Uh, in, in imperialism historically, colonialism, these were all bad from a, from a, a, a libertarian perspective. Um, so we have to, as we often have to do in these situations, try to untangle the ways in which the state has made matters worse and the ways in which underlying market forces uh, have produced the better outcomes. So we just we just need to be uh, really careful to distinguish uh, uh, th those those kinds of arguments uh, and, and say, look, the real world's messy. It's a combination of bad things that states did. And if, you know, if if we had had a libertarian world 200 years ago, we wouldn't have had the sort of colonialism that we had. We wouldn't have the imperialism that we have today. Um, but to sort of automatically connect those up with markets and capitalism, that's the problem. In fact. Um, one of the things that, that we that we need to to, to uh, remind folks of is that the 19th century classical liberals were were strong anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist, and it's only in the 20th century that the conservative right has somehow linked together imperialism, militarism, and their supposed defense of capitalism. It was classical liberals in the 19th century, and even people like Herbert Spencer, so reviled by the left. Okay. Um, I'm looking at, at, at Alan's last comment about you know that the first world is exploiting the third world. I think to, to address that, you have to ask people what 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 specific kind of exploitation are you thinking about here, right? What who you know what's what's the you know is it is it that the third world is poor because the first world is rich? That is, our gains and wealth are the cause of their poverty. And if that's the case, I think you have to respond by saying, well, no. Let's look at the institutions and practices those societies have adopted internally. Right to see whether that you know if you've got a country like um, I mean, almost any of the sub-Saharan African countries that have adopted all kinds of uh, socialist all kinds of socialist policies uh, in, internally, of course that's going to make them poor. That's not our fault, right? In the sense, or not market's fault or capitalism's fault, right? That's they've adopted bad policies. Worth pointing out, by the way, that a lot of the post-colonial leaders in the third world uh, were actually educated in the West at Western universities and picked up their bad ideas from from the West. So, if you want to make the argument that the first world's exploiting the third world, um, you could say that, that it's true intellectually <laughs> in the sense that that we exported a whole lot of bad ideas about how to run an economy uh, that the people in the third world picked up on and adopted and just, and then destroyed their economies with. But I'm not sure that's what they have what lefties have in mind when they say the first world is exploiting the, the third world. And I want to just second an earlier comment I saw go by on Kevin Carson's work on, in general, but also on, on imperialism. I'm a, I'm a fan of Kevin's. I don't agree with everything he says. I'm not quite as far along as, as uh, uh, to, to the left libertarian position as he is, but I think he has done some really terrific work. Um, and I think as a general rule, especially with what's going on in the world in the last couple of weeks, um, the more that we emphasize as libertarians, um, the the idea of the anti-militarism and anti-colonialism and our respect for for third world for third world uh, uh, for developing countries to develop their own endogenous uh, uh, practices um, yeah and and Sam jumped just jumped in and uh, I think that's exactly that's exactly right uh, that's a point I made at the outset you may have popped in late but but right that in generally we with with folks on the left, we want the same things. We agree on the ends, and we disagree on the means. And I, that, For me, that was number one in my list of, of ways we engage people on the left, because I think once, once, we, once we don't make it clear to them right, that, that we agree on the ends, they're less likely to hear what we have to say. Uh, I'm looking at Carol's last comment. Uh, uh, a problem is technological. Uh, third, yeah, well, I think that's exactly right, Carol, that, that, that and, and I would note that one of the reasons that third worlders, developing countries, think they need to have the big technology instead of better small-scale local technology is because the, <clears throat> the big technology is what places like the World Bank and the IMF and others and other uh, governments have wanted. Uh, both World Bank, IMF, and the national governments uh, see those big projects. Those are visible uh, results, right? You can point to those and say, we built this giant dam or this huge irrigation system or whatever it was, right? And that makes it look like you've made progress, when the real progress is almost always incremental. Even in our own history in the West, right? We didn't. It wasn't big things that made us go. It was the slow accretion of change over time in in a, in a relatively free society. So I think Carol's quite right. And I think one of the things that 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 again, another way we can talk with the left on, on these sort of international issues is to argue that uh, we're 
bigger critics of the World Bank and the IMF and those sorts of institutions than they are. As far as I'm concerned, I'd just shut them down today. There's no reforming those. Just get rid of them. Those have done more damage to the folks in the rest of the world. Uh, another example, too, to play on this issue, I was, my campus uh, had a really interesting student event a couple weeks ago where the student libertarian group, the student democrats, and the student republicans had a kind of tri-debate where each one presented their views on a whole bunch of different issues. It was very nice. Uh, but one of the issues that really got going was the agricultural subsidies issue. And I think that's another place where we can make common cause with the left and say, look, we, you know, because many of the left will say agricultural subsidies have uh, 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 hurt third world farmers by shutting them, U.S. agricultural subsidies hurt them by shutting them out of our market. Completely true. The best thing we could do for third world, small scale third world farming is to get rid of our own agricultural subsidies here in the United States. At the same time, of course, that would reduce prices on goods in the U.S., both by getting rid of the, the subsidies and by bringing in that foreign competition, which is good for the U.S. poor, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that many on the left in the U.S. Um, see that point about agricultural subsidies in terms of the third world, but will support, say, dairy subsidies that end up subsidizing agribusiness in the U.S. at the expense of poor folks for whom dairy products are a bigger portion of their income uh, than, than, uh, than for many others. So yeah, there are these kinds of particular policies where we can, where we can, move, where we can move things along. And someone noted earlier uh, that uh, uh, the, the idea that the powerful are always out to exploit the less powerful. And, and again, we can, we can use that argument too, right? I think one of the things that we can point out is when you expand the role of government to regulate markets, who's going to be best able to take advantage of that? It's going to be those who are who have the power to access and, and, and influence the political process, namely the very people, especially the larger corporations, who we're trying to regulate. Um, I had a Facebook thread the other day, and I should note, by the way, that I am I'm on Facebook, and uh, if folks want to shoot me friend requests when this is over, uh, please do. Uh, you can put a little note saying, you know, uh, you saw me on the uh, the uh, on the web, uh, but I'm happy to add more Facebook friends. And one of the things we had a Facebook, I had a Facebook thread the other day, uh, talking about the, these issues um, and making the, and sort of really making this point that that you know, people are fooling themselves if they think uh, regulation will check the power of large corporations. It just gives them more. And just looking at Christopher's question, um, arguments from fear regarding the, the free market. Uh, yeah, how would how would um, uh, how would the sort of least well-off be taken care of, uh, that, that uh, you know, people should be forced to, uh, to, to support them through tax, how an education support center be provided for. One really, well, one answer is Carol's answer from earlier, which is small-scale communities and, and, and we, we take care, you know, people take care of themselves in local communities. But, uh, but a broader scale, I'll recommend a book to you, and actually maybe if I type it into, um, I'll put it into the Facebook chat. Um, Oh, I'm blanking on the title. Dave Beto's book on the welfare state. It's hard to remember this stuff when, uh, when you're doing it live. But if you Google uh, Dave Beto, who's a libertarian historian, and his wonderful book on the welfare state, which is probably sitting on the shelf behind me, um, if you Google that, you'll find his book from uh, from a while back. And what Dave did in that book was to show how uh, the institutions that existed prior to the advent of the welfare state really did help people. These voluntary local institutions, charitable institutions, uh, community groups often based on ethnicity, you know, uh, the, you know, we now have the Kiwanis and Lions Club, but, but before that, those kinds of groups really did provide uh, uh, medical services, insurance services for people before the rise of the welfare state. And it's a really nice bit of history that, that sort of mutual aid to the welfare state. Thank you, Pete. Hey, Pete, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, from mutual aid to the welfare state. That's the book, um, and I and I think uh, that's a you know Dave's book is available in paperback. It's not expensive. But that's a great place to start to start to sort of say, well, look, before the government did this, a lot of these things were done in pri private ways. And I think again, with the advent of technology and lower lower uh, 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 sort of cost of communication, uh, there's ways we can recapture some of that today. And we're seeing people do it. We're seeing people uh, provide services for each other in these ways uh, uh, outside government very effectively, uh, with the internet being a key a key part of that. So th I think that's one point you can raise when people raise the sort of what about the poor. 
core question. Um, I think you can, you know, if you, you can also make the more general point that hopefully we, we reasonably believe a freer society would be a wealthier society and, and so on. Uh, that that's going to help. That's going to help people. Lowering taxes enables families to save more and provide for themselves more. Uh, but in general, when people think government's going to do something, they're less likely to develop their own solutions to the problem. And so, uh, as, as Beto's book points out, the advent of the welfare state just wiped out these old these old institutions because people just assume, well, now government's doing it. We don't. What do we need to give to these charities or, or work with these organizations if the state's taking care of it? And yeah, Pete, uh, the Voluntary City is a terrific book along these same lines too. Uh, I would recommend that to folks who are interested in these questions. Um, uh, Taylor Harris has you know, raised Tom Sowell here, and, and Sowell has done some good work on, on, on this as well. So I think, again, part of it is to say to, to lefties who raise this, well, isn't it our collective, if you think it's our collective responsibility, how is it more moral to force people at the point of a gun to help one another? Um, I just saw Eric's comment. And I think, yeah, I think this is, uh, Walter does have that streak in him, a, a sort of po local popular streak. And I think that's, again, there's a long tradition in African American thinking in the U.S. of this sort of a self help tradition that goes back, you know, a hundred years or so. Uh, and a lot, and, and you see it crop up, you know, in, in different places today. Uh, and I think that that, uh, for black conservatives and black libertarians, you see some of that. But even on the left, you see this within the African American community, this this strong uh, notion of self help. And uh, again, I think here's another kind of issue to think about. Uh, oftentimes, people will say, "Well, won't, won't markets be harmful to to African Americans or Hispanic Americans?" And here's a place where knowing the history really helps. If if you go back, okay, and look at the ways, the, the biggest enemy of Black progress in the United States has been the state. Uh, obviously, slavery being the big one, but even even you know in the a after slavery, um, the Jim Crow laws that was government. That wasn't markets. That was government restricting markets. And in fact, there's a number of good uh, historical papers that look at the ways in which markets were breaking down racial barriers, and that's precisely what upset the proponents of Jim Crow, right, the racists, who said, oh, well, now you've got, you know, we've got rid of slavery's over, blacks and whites are in the marketplace, all their money's green, that's not good, we can't have that, okay, and so the racists were able to use Jim Crow as a way to, to prevent the kind of breaking down of, of racial barriers that markets were promoting. Um, moving into the 20th century, just a couple quick examples, uh, African Americans, many African Americans, uh, hated the New Deal. Okay, uh, and and they understood correctly that a lot of the provisions, certainly the early New Deal, the National Recovery Act and uh, administration, and the Agricultural Adjustment Act, were raising, the, for example, the NRA raised the cost of labor, which shut a lot of blacks out of the workplace. And if you read again, Dave Beto and Dave Bernstein, another uh, Bernstein is a is a legal scholar that's done some of this history, have looked at this, and and you can see the evidence for how many at the time uh, African American newspapers were uh, were, were uh, objecting to the provisions of the New Deal. I mean, we think today of the New Deal being sort of, the, you know, helping the downtrodden, but they recognized at the time that many of these government interventions uh, were, were uh, in fact, harmful to the very people they were aimed to help. The other example, not so much after that, of course, is minimum wage, right? Today we think of minimum wage being the thing that keeps, you know, black Americans and others out of poverty. But originally, the proponents of the minimum wage in the United States in the 1940s, the federal minimum wage, were the racists and the xenophobes, right? They were the ones who were saying, they knew, understood, and, and the unions in particular, correctly, that passing a minimum wage law would shut lower-skilled African-American and immigrant labor out of the labor market. Uh, and, and that's why, again, more history, why minimum wage pr provisions were part of apartheid in South Africa. If you look at the original set of laws that were passed in 1911, 1912, they included what was called rate for the work, which was a, their version of a minimum wage law. Why would the white racist national South Africans pass a minimum wage law? They knew it shut native labor out of the market. Um, and a really interesting argument here that has come out in the next few days, and a colleague of mine and I are working on a Freeman article on this, so if you're a Freeman reader, you'll see this down the road, I think, uh, is the relationship between the minimum wage law and eugenics movements at the turn of the 20th century. One of the great lost histories of the left, and unfortunate bits of the left, is how much of the so-called progressive left 100 years ago uh, adopted eugenics and, and thought that the, what government should be doing is to be sort of cleaning society out of the genetically uh, 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 unacceptable or inferior. 
And economists at the time, lefty economists at the time, understood that minimum wage laws caused unemployment and made people poor, uh, especially among the lower class and lower skill. They thought that was a good thing, right? If you believed in eugenics, that was one way to, again, impoverish those people and get them out, you know, quote, clean them out. So there's, there's you know, really, uh, when, we, when we look back at this history, we have to, you know, look really carefully and, our, and sort of say, Historically, who's done more for the, le the least well-off in society? Okay, one other way to think about it is the rich have always lived well. Even you know, certainly, 200 years ago, being rich was not as nice as being poor and middle class today. But still, you did okay. What what markets and what freedom, the degree we've had over the last several hundred years, has done is enabled poor people to not just live, but to live in ways that rich people hundreds of years ago would have envied. If you look at what poor Americans have today in their households, right, it's more than more stuff than the average middle class American had in the 1970s, and certainly more than, than most Americans had ever. Right? I mean, the cell phone is a miracle. If you could have shown a cell phone to someone a hundred years ago, right, that, you know, you mean everyone has, people in Africa have one of those? Yeah. Okay, so I think when we think about what markets have done for the poor, we need to always be mindful of the bigger picture. Well, that was a really long answer to several questions at the same time. Um, but see, you got me going, so that, that's what happens. I guess we've got maybe five minutes left. Uh, if, there's more, if there's more questions on Facebook, I'm happy to, uh, happy to entertain them. I, what I will put on Facebook is, uh, thanks, George, uh, if I can get it to cooperate. If you want to check out my own website, I think it's linked in the conference material, but... I will put it into the Facebook chat. My type whoops. My typing skills work. I've been watching the debtor prison conversation go by, um, but I'm I'm not gonna touch that. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if this if this worked. There you go. Whoops. Link didn't work, but because there's two slashes in there, but that's it. Um, you can find me there on the web. Uh, there's some there's some stuff there on the web. The other thing I guess I should pass on to as long as we're talking about resources. Is uh, I blog with a bunch of other Austrian economists. If you haven't checked out our blog, if, you, if you've never checked out this blog, this is the place to go. Um, and the other blog I'll recommend here too uh, is uh, uh, real quick is because of the topic of this conversation. There's a brand new blog called Bleeding Heart Libertarians. And if you Google that phrase, bleeding heart libertarians, I think you'll find the blog. That's a group of mostly philosophers and political theorists. Some, many of you know, may, rot, know, may know Roderick Long. He's uh, one of the folks involved with that group. And that, that has, be, that has uh, become a really, uh, a really hot place for libertarian conversations these days uh, over at Bleeding Heart Libertarians because they are particularly interested in these sort of means ends and engaging the left type arguments. So if you haven't checked out that blog, you should definitely check it out as well. Um, let me scroll back down. Uh, Carol asked about selling off government land. Please, yes, <laughs> always a good, always a good idea. Uh, and uh, and you know, if you're looking for ways to reduce the debt, that's one way to start. Is is by is you know, let, we've got government owns lots of land and doesn't do a very good job with managing much of it. Let's let's sell that off and uh, and 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 and. Uh, and get rid of it, right? Um, and, and use it to retire the debt. I don't want to use it, obviously, to spend more, but sell it off, get it in private hands or in, in, in the hands of Nature Conservancy or whomever, uh, and then and then uh, uh, use those funds to pay down the debt because um, that debt is going to come back to bite us big time. So a couple more minutes. I'm trying to think if I've got can sort of throw some more web resources at you um, that that are worth that are worth looking at. Um, yeah, I just saw Eric's comment. Yeah, right. That's it. A auction off the wilderness areas to environmentalist groups. I think that's a that's a great idea. Let them manage it themselves. I think one of the things that 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 I think we need to, you know, I don't know if I'd phrase it this way all the time, but with folks on the left, and this goes to the welfare stuff too. Put your money where your mouth is, right? If if you think these things are so important and so valuable, you need. To recognize that there's that if you think that's the case, you should be providing these ways of helping. Um, that and, and when we recognize all the ways in which bureaucracy is inefficient and freedom restricting and all these sorts of things, if we really want to help people, we need to help them by 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 uh, moving them by moving them uh, 
by moving them uh, uh, forward in these kinds of ways through, through these other kinds of institutions. And yes, another good, another good recommendation from George there too. Uh, C4SS is a great, is a great group, uh, and, and you should check out their stuff. A lot of, lot of good stuff there. I'm looking at Charles' last comment. Um, it's true, yeah, a lot of debt in the country wasn't incurred for the benefit of the inhabitants. Um, I've never heard that phrase "odious debt" before. That's that's interesting. Um, it seems to me, though, it, you know. The only option the government selling off those lands, of course, is again homesteading, right? Um, and I think, I think again, not a bad idea, especially if you want to make the argument that the land was taken wrongly to begin with, that that uh, in some, uh, you know, the underlying rights belong to the users and to the folks who occupied it before the government declared it was theirs. Um, you know, again, that you can get into some messy historical justice issues there. Uh, but, but yeah, homesteading lotteries, again, all possible ways to, to do this. But I think what you do is you can say to folks on the left, you think government hasn't managed this land well, well, make some donations, get George Soros, you know, buy up the land, manage it the way you want to. That ties to Carol's earlier point, again, about local uh, self-governing institutions and all these, all these sorts of things. Well, my clock says 12.55, um, so I want to thank all of you uh, for joining me. And again, I mean, just encourage you to continue the conversation over on Facebook. I can't stay here. I've got some other things I have to do this afternoon. But please, feel free to friend me on Facebook. So thanks all for, for, for being part of it. I hope it was valuable.